So we, we, we wanted you to do the intro, Joe. Sure. Okay. Ready? Hi, I'm Joe Hockey, former ambassador, former treasurer, former member of parliament, but just a small businessman doing my little bit in the United States trying to earn a buck. And I'm with my old mate, Mark Burris. He can learn a, learn a thing or two from me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes, that's it. That you just nailed it. Okay, welcome to another episode of Straight Talk. And I've got my good friend, and uh, by the way, uh, respectfully to him, um, our ex-ambassador or former ambassador for Australia and the United States of America. And of course, um, at once upon a time, the uh, former treasurer of this great country of ours, Joe Hockey. How you going, mate? I'm fantastic, Mark. You look so good. You're getting younger every day. How I wish, mate. Joe, you're, 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 you're operating right now out of Washington. So you're in your apartment yeah. in Washington. You haven't come home. Your family's come home, but you're running a new business called Bondo Partners. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. Look, you know, this is my third career. I started off as a corporate lawyer and then went into public service for 24 years, 20 years in elected office and then four years as ambassador. And then you say to yourself, well, okay, I've got to have another career and what am I going to do? And I saw a yawning gap in the relationship between the United States and Australia where Australian businesses coming to the US thought they knew everything and made lots of mistakes, wasted lots of money. Some of them did really well, but a lot were really badly burned. And a number of American companies going to Australia didn't quite understand Australia. I looked at the business model of Taneo, which started as a Ireland-United States liaison business, Bain & Co., which uh, started as a strategic advisory business. So we've set up Bondi Partners, which is strategic advisory, it's like an air traffic controller for companies that want to either come into the United States or go into Australia. Now the environment is far more regulated than it has been in the past. So we help companies navigate and that includes everything from management advice to public relations, government relations, but also we are in the middle of transactions, some multi-billion dollar transactions where we are strategic advisors to the parties. And that's really, that's great fun. There's a lot of people here in Australia now, I mean, and to some extent the pandemic has fast tracked this, but there's a lot of people here in Australia now who are looking to sell their product and or services into other places in the world, like for example, the United States. And a lot of them are just small business owners. I mean, what are the, some of the traps that, uh, that you've uncovered that people should be aware of? I mean, like, why would they go and see Bondi Partners? Why do they need Joe Hockey's help? Where are the issues? I mean. Yeah, you know, especially if you're an import-export business or an on- online business or a banking services business, what are, they, what, are you, what are you doing for them that they probably should be aware of before they actually launch off their business in the United States? Well, the starting point is we help them find the right accountants, the right lawyers, if they're engaging with government, the right lobbyists. A lot of businesses coming into the US that want to deal with the US government think it's just like dealing with the New South Wales or Queensland government or something. It's not. It's very complicated. There's a lot of rules. We also, you know, will provide some networks, business to business networks. In fact, almost all our business is B2B. And even though we're in Washington, DC and in Canberra, it's uh, it's LA and Sydney that are, you know, the, the sort of commercial hotspots with New York. And we're finding that helping people to find the right markets in the United States is crucial. And as you know, Mark, you know, 340 million people. I mean, and and every state of the United States is like a different country. It has its own regulation. It's not like Australia. And even just setting up our own business. Oh, my God, dealing with the banks. I mean, uh, dealing with the banks in Australia can be tough. Dealing, but, you know, it's, it's, it's like a happy marriage with Australian banks compared to setting up bank accounts over here, trying to understand how they work, setting up a company over here. We made the mistake of setting up Bondi Partners at first in Washington, D.C., because I'm used to, you know, registering the company at the place where it logically first opens its office. But no, you've got to go to Delaware and then transferring data. Oh, my God, it's just been very costly and, uh, and a really good experience, which I wouldn't want others to have to go through. 
I mean, one of the things I remember, because I, I've been involved in a company that was uh, had its headquarters in Chicago and I was the chair of the company, but had offices here in Australia. And I mean, you just mentioned Delaware. I mean, what you're sort of posting, and you, you also said this, you're posting out there right now is that the taxes in the various states in the United States, in other words, where, you're, where you are business residents of, in other words, where your company's yeah, registered, yeah. can be horrendous. It makes a big difference. Uh... I, you know, Washington, D.C. is like Canberra. It's very small. And then it's got the equivalent in New South Wales, which would be, say, Maryland, uh, around it. But also you've got Virginia. So, And just across this river, I would have saved tens of thousands of dollars if I had my apartment on the other side of the river. But because it's both an office for our six staff here and my home, this apartment, uh, just as we get the business up and running, the rest of the team didn't want to cross the bridge. So, you know, you, you end up paying far more taxes just to be in Washington, D.C. You know, it's that's why a lot of people go to Florida. That's why they go to Texas and state, or, or even Washington State, where there's zero income tax. But if you're, for example, if you earn any income outside of your home state, then you have to lodge a separate tax return in each state. So professional footballers and baseballers who will be paid for travelling games, and so on, they have to lodge 20, 25 tax returns for each individual state plus the federal tax return. It's, it's, it's a crazy system. The point being too is that, okay, well, then that's complicated, which means I need a good accountant or a good lawyer. And then well, yeah. who's a good accountant who's a good lawyer? I don't know. So, I mean, I, I get what Bondi Partners does is you, you'll you direct people to the right place. I mean, you'll sort of say, well, you know, here's someone you've had some experience with in terms of accountancy or, or, or legal matters or, sure. or, or for that matter, exactly. lobbyists. Um, you know, because how do you find these people? Like, I mean, if it was me setting up, I know when we try to set up our business in the US, it was like a nightmare for us. In the end, we used someone like Grant Thornton or whatever, but it was, yeah. a, it was a nightmare. And... And you might pick a big firm just because you feel comfort in a big firm, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the individual at the big firm who you're dealing with, and you have no sense of whether that individual is any good or not because you never dealt with them before. And then you could be, yeah. you know, you could be up the uh, swanee for a lot of money really quickly, and you found out that you got the wrong individual. So I, I sort of get the market. I see, get, I see what the demand is for Bondi Partners, equally for Americans coming to Australia too, I guess. Oh sure, and and. You know, there's a whole lot of things that are at play, like uh, the foreign investment rules have changed in both countries dramatically over the last two years. So it's not as easy as just coming over and buying a company. Or, uh, and then, uh, you know, that's the same into Australia. Every, every major acquisition in Australia has to be uh, go before FERB, even for Americans now. And that's, that's quite the roadblock for American companies going into Australia. Even if it's like a so, dollar investment. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, same here. It's, uh, it's you know, and increasingly, uh, you know, the military and intelligence considerations are coming into play. And we give a lot of advice to clients about the deteriorating uh, geopolitical relationship between the US and China, which obviously is playing out in Australia. I mean, a number of our clients, and they are bigger, you know, companies that come to us, are trying desperately to understand it. And they've got big markets in China. But... You know, we're saying to them, you've got to choose because the one thing that unites Washington is they're all heading in the same direction, Democrat and Republicans, on China. And it's uh, a significant deterioration in the relationship, which will have an impact on Australia. I do want to talk about that because, it, to me, it fascinates me. I, I, I just, If I could just peel it back a little bit, you've been in, how long have you been in the US now? Nearly five years, yeah. So, you know, you probably well and truly... Um, um, initiated into the cultural differences between the United States, doing business in the United States relative to doing the business in Australia. I mean, and probably it's different state by state for that matter. I have no sense of it other than I did do a lot of business in the Midwest and I found it really difficult, to be honest, culturally. Um, Midwest yeah. people are a certain type of person in business, very conservative, um, the ones I dealt with, conservative in every, in every respect. They, they don't work at the same pace, for example, that I got used to working with people in New York. They're very family-centric. They like to go to their footy or their basketball or their or, or hockey, etc. They're very sociable. And you don't get this, I never used to get the same hours out of them as I did for the office we had in New York. Would you, do you explain 
just explain to our listeners anyway, what what are the cultural differences that you've experienced and what should people mm. expect? Well, you know, there are, there are numerous cultural differences. Americans used to say to me, well, you know, what are Australians like? I'd say, well, we're just like Californians, except we like America. And they, they all get that, right? <laughs> because Californians are big critics of the rest of America. They think they're a separate country, of course. And, and in many ways, every part of America is different. I mean, the people in the, in the far south are incredibly hospitable, very generous, very welcoming, you know, big focus on, on food and culture, you know, heavy Hispanic influence, but also, you know, European influence in places like Mobile, Alabama, where the, the first Mardi Gras was held, not, not, not New Orleans, uh, but New Orleans is a wild town. And then you move across to, you know, say Texas, which is, again, different. Texans are, you know, have enormous hearts, very good people, but uh, their guns, God and oil are, uh, are dominant in their lives. Florida, look at the ageing population. It's, it's incredible. Miami is basically the capital of uh, Latin America, you know, effectively. And then you come up the coast to the, to the northeast and you, you've got the New Yorks, so you've got your Bostons and people are familiar with that in Washington, D.C. But, you know, it's a different type of lifestyle and, and engagement altogether. And then, as you say, the Midwest, soul of the earth people, uh, travel at their own pace, used to big agriculture uh, and derivatives out of agriculture, particularly Chicago. And then, uh, of course, you got Techville, the other side of, of the US. And it's not just the Seattles and the San Francisco's, but LA is coming into play big time as a, as a business center. And also Denver uh, is really significant as well in technology and it's a great quality of life. So, you know, every part of America is different. You know, I still, Remember the first dinner party we had when I was ambassador and we had the National Cathedral Choir Fundraiser. This was a, a hangover fundraiser that Kim Beasley left me to hold. And, um, you know, the average age was about 65. Maybe, no, I'm exaggerating. Would have been about 80 or <laughs> something like that, right? They were an older group. And somehow we got into a conversation about guns. And there was one man sitting next to me at the table and, uh, and, you know, uh, I said, well, look, I, I just don't understand America's gun culture. And, and this man next to me, who was a Virginian, he described himself as a Virginian rather than American. And he said, look, I carry a gun everywhere with me at all times, including right now. And he's sitting at the dinner table, right? My dinner table in the ambassador's residence, the Australian ambassador. And my wife was down the end of the table. And I could see her eyes just about to explode out of her head and she's looking up towards the kids' bedrooms and it was just, oh, you know, like, what the hell, right? And there'd been a, a quadruple murder just around the corner only a few months before we got there. Terrible quadruple murder. Uh, and we had violence, you know, in and around the residence and it was in the best part of Washington. So, you know, it, and one FBI agent said to me, uh, he said, you know, the safest place I feel in America is, is in Texas because I know everyone has a gun. He said, but if I'm in other parts, you know, I'm, I, and, and if I'm doing a pulling over a car, you're walking up to a car. He said, it's, you know, you, you, you've got your heart in your hands. Every time you walk up to the driver's side, you know, of the car. So it's, a, it's an entirely different culture on something where Australians have a settled position like guns or Philanthropy. I think Americans are very, very good with philanthropy, but they need to be because they haven't got the safety net in the community. You know, countries that have had revolutions and civil wars are culturally different to Australia. And, and you know, in China, which has had both a revolution and a civil war, Beijing will never trust its people. That's why it always spies on them because it's gone through that upheaval. In the United States, if it didn't have a constitution framed the way it is, if it didn't have a, a inherent desire for freedom and liberty, it would be like China. It would be constantly spying on its people. And the people still think the government does spy with the deep state, as they call it, right? But, you know, there is an element, a strong element of distrust between a government and its people when there has been a revolution or a civil war. And Australia is blessed that it didn't have that. 
that it didn't have a revolutionary war. Thank God we've never had any, you know, anything like a civil war. And it means that there is this compact between the government and the people that is able to, you know, survive and sustain. And, and that's a big difference. Well, uh, Joe, what do Americans think then of Australia's culture? I mean, what do they think of us? I mean, do they think of us all as Paul Hogan or... I mean, no, they love us. They, there is a deep-seated affection for Australia and everything Australian. I mean, it's, you know, I find it quite grating seeing ads on television talking about, uh, you know, Australian Steakhouse, and apparently no Australians involved in it at all, but it's a franchise all through America it's selling, you know, Australian Outback. Steakhouse or something, it's called something like that. Or there's, you know, an Australian palm oil or something that is meant to, you know, uh, make you 40 pounds lighter and, and, and take 20 years off your life. And I see that on TV. And there's all these reflections on Australia because w when I was tourism minister in Australia, I dealt with the head of American Express in, here in the United States, uh, a guy, Ken Chino, like a legend uh, in in in. in financial circles. And he said to me, every single year they surveyed American Express cardholders and the most desired travel destination in the world for Americans was Australia. If time and money were no impediment, Australia was the number one. So, um, and that's still the case today. Everyone wants to go to Australia. They just don't get the time and they might not have the money. Joe, do you think that's because, um, similar to what China thinks about our products, they, they love the provenance of Australian products. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sense of cleanliness and purity and yeah. freshness and, uh, well, as I said, provenance. You know, you can actually see from where it was curated originally. You can nearly go back and look at the, the, the grass that the cow ate that produced the milk that we now consume in China or wherever it happens to be. Sure. Is it about that? Uh, it's a multitude of factors. Look, the starting point is, Australia in the minds of many middle-class Americans is what they want America to be. Right. Clear air, clean water, uh, you know, a safe environment where you can, you can walk down the street where, you know, there is no extreme violence, where everyone can have a go and people are happy. People are happy. I mean, it's, it's the, you know, and Australia, of course, is the most multicultural nation on earth. And for a lot of people, uh, America might be the beacon of multiculturalism, but it still has some pretty significant ingrained racial tensions. And, you know, you can't easily get over the, 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 the horrible scars of slavery. I mean, really, they are, the, you know, it is, it is still prevalent in society. And African-Americans, black Americans represent 12% of the population but there is still rightly a deep-seated guilt in many parts of America about what happened years ago. And se segregation and self-segregation are pretty powerful parts of, uh, parts of American society today. It's interesting because the Hispanics make up a bigger percentage, much bigger percentage than African-Americans. There isn't the same racial division with Hispanics as there is with African-Americans. And, uh, and, you know, um, it's quite interesting in this election to see the Hispanics uh, going with Trump. Pretty significant numbers in places like Florida because they're so scarred by socialism. They see Biden or the people behind Biden as a socialist. And that's resonating with uh, Venezuelans, with Puerto Ricans, with, uh, you know, Mexicans and others who have moved to America. Can we talk about that? Do you mind talking about us talking now about a little bit of that, or is it? Or the, talk about anything you want. Okay, mate. Well, I mean, like, it's I, never I, stopped you before. I, I, I know, but I just don't want to put you in a bad position. That's all because I mean, you're the ex ambassador, but or former ambassador. But hello. I, I, but I've been watching. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Paul Murray tragic, um, and uh, I watched Jonesy before that. I'm addicted to it, right? And it's a little bit like your Fox News over there. Only because, only because in the morning I get whacked by the ABC and everybody else from the other side and it, I just need something to balance my life up a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the narrative from our point of view here in Australia is what's going, about what's going on over there. It seems to me that uh, Trump, you know, as you probably know, I know the guy, I met, him, I met him years ago when we did the show. Trump is, it appears to me that Trump's being absolutely attacked by all the mediums other than Fox. 
and it looks as though the various mediums, various media, I should say, are pro-Democrats. Is it, and, the, and we keep getting told about the polls, but then on the other hand, Trump will get on and say, no, the polls are all wrong, they're the wrong polls, they're not the right polls to listen to. Where do you see it sit? I mean, you've been in politics, you're, you're experiencing firsthand over there what's going, where do you see this all sit? Are we looking for a Biden uh, a landslide and then the stock market's gonna crash and uh, you know, China's gonna take control of the world? I mean, where do you see all this stuff? Where, where, where's it all sitting, mate? Donald Trump was elected as a disruptive force. I mean, the most powerful line he had at the last election was, what do you got to lose voting for me? What do you got to lose? How's it going for you? You know, we've got this slow growth. You've got huge gun violence. Uh, you've lost control of your borders. If you're a black American, you know, your wages are depressed. You've got an opioid crisis. Uh, you've got huge violence, like in Chicago and New York. How's that going for you, right? What, what do you got to lose picking someone from outside the swamp? And he won. And he won as a disruptive force. I think over the last four years, there has been no let up on him, but he has invited that as well in many ways. I mean, because, you know, he, he, he's, he's a showman. And combative. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he, he loves a fight. I mean, he, he loves, he's always been in the ring. You know, it's driven him mad when Joe Biden was in the basement and he was in the ring and he was itching, you know, to throw a few punches and he couldn't. And um, so, you know, I, I, I speak to Paul Murray every Monday night at 10 o'clock during this period, so you've got to stay awake for that. I do watch you. Uh, you know, Donald Trump, because he, he's done, he's made two major, he's made some major errors, but the, the ones that are hard to deal with, number one, he didn't build a, a team around him that he could trust. And so he hasn't got any of the good political advice that you need from time to time. If people, too many people are afraid to say to him what he needs to hear. That's, that's number one. And you always, you know, when I was a minister for 13 years and uh, ambassador, I needed people that would come in and say, listen, you've got to change here. You've got, you've got this wrong. And if I didn't listen to them, I usually made big mistakes. But... I didn't fire them for giving me that advice. Donald Trump did. And that's the first mistake. The second mistake is, because he didn't do the first thing, he never sat down with anyone and worked out what he wants to do for the next four years. So if you were to ask me, what is his plan for America for the next four years? I've got to tell you, I don't know. Because he's spending so much time talking about himself and dealing with the coronavirus that he's not talking about what matters to the person I call Mary Milwaukee. Right, Mary Milwaukee. We have Betty Banks down in Australian yeah. politics, right? And you know, I'd be the, I'd constantly think to myself, what is Betty thinking about these policies? You know, how's she going with it, right? And here I created the fictional character Mary Milwaukee. Mary Milwaukee works at um, Walmart, earns eleven dollars eleven an hour, which is twenty percent above, you know, the average. She's been there for years. She's had a son that's done three tours of duty at Afghanistan and she frets about him every day. Daughter that wants to go to college, but the fees are just so prohibitive. Doesn't know how that's ever going to be paid for. And her husband is one of, you know, three million truck drivers in America that every time they see a new technology that says driverless cars or trucks, he's wondering whether he's going to have a job, you know? And, uh, and she was made to feel guilty about going to church being, you know, a heterosexual, she was made to feel guilty about, you know, her brother working in the mine, coal mines in West Virginia, made to feel guilty about the fact that she didn't get a tertiary education. And she's wondering, she's paying more for her health care, and she's wondering, how's this, how's this life going? Where am I going to end up? Everything that was certain in her life became uncertain. Trump went to those people and said, I'm going to make you great again. I'm going to bring us back to what we were bring back the manufacturing jobs. I'm going to control the borders. I'm going to stand up to the world. We're not going to keep paying and, and fighting in other people's wars. They've got to pay themselves. And, you know, we're, not, we, 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 we're going to focus on America first. And we're going to focus on you, Mary Milwaukee. Somehow he lost that. And not only did he lose Mary Milwaukee, or is he losing Mary Milwaukee, but, you know, he's... he's most significantly losing her mum and dad because of the coronavirus, because they're scared. They're scared. 
of the coronavirus and uh you know the the they're scared of being you know that that terrible graphic scene in new york of piling bodies into the back of a truck i mean that really spooked america will biden rent win these people over though Joe? you know he's gone from being uh in the mind of americans too old to be trump has somehow managed to make him a safe pair of hands that's what he did i mean by being erratic on the coronavirus by you know being flippant about you know injecting yourself with detergent or whatever it was you know yeah. i mean that that it, it went from infotainment to sort of a bad joke you know and and people lost their sense of humor along the way and they wanted a safe pair of hands. You know, they're increasingly saying they want a safe pair of hands. And Joe Biden has managed to make himself a safe pair of hands, you know? Well, so yeah. w w are you saying on balance you think that Biden's going to win it yeah. right, right now? As of today, Biden would win in a landslide. I mean, really significant landslide. And, and what do you think that's going to do to the markets over there? I mean, what, you know, what, what, what do you foresee being the... The economic fallout. If, well, if one goes. of his key policies is to reverse Donald Trump's tax cuts for business. And, you know, lower business taxes means they're more likely to employ more people, as is what actually happened in the United States. I mean, un unemployment was at a record low just before the coronavirus. I mean, the American economy, they had rising wages. Black Americans had the highest wage rises ever. So, you know, Donald Trump said that, but it's actually factually true. And, you know, the opioid crisis was being dealt with and you did have control of the borders and uh, it went on and on, right? So he actually delivered what he promised. So Trump went to the last election and said, I promised you I would pull out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. He pulled out of that. I'll pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'll pull out of that. I'll move the embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv. He did that. Uh, I will start pulling troops back from Afghanistan and Iraq. He's done that. I will increase military spending. I've done that. I will start punishing those countries that aren't paying their way on military spending in NATO. He did that. I will tear up the trade agreement with Canada and Mexico and renegotiate it. He did that. I will build a wall with Mexico to stop people coming across the border without approval. He did that. And he'll say, well, when did you last have a president that delivered everything they promised? And he's right. He's right. He actually has delivered all the things he promised, whether you like them or not. He has done what no one else has done for a long, long period of time. And that's what he should have focused on. And Biden now is saying, hey, I'm going to reverse your tax cuts. And if cutting taxes creates jobs, as we've just seen in Australia, then increasing taxes is going to stop jobs. Mm. So why? How does how does Joe Biden get away with saying that in the election campaign? Well, because Donald Trump's not focused on. Are there market indicators that set, I mean, because when Trump when Trump during the Trump period to the you know stock the, the U.S. stock exchange or the um, or the market yeah the markets went were, through the roof were, were, ne were never as good like they're unbelievably good so incredible yeah. Just, uh, they're running at records. And to some extent, Australia, we ran off the back of that too. The whole world runs off the back of how well America is doing to a large extent. Yeah. If Biden, is there, are there any indicators or anybody now talking about what they think will happen if Biden gets in? Because the, the, the stock exchange is saying, oh, well, sure, we're sure. going to drop the ball. So you'll see taxes go up. And if you're in the stock market, there's a fear that, that well, you might as well realise your capital gains, right, before the market goes down. Because Joe Biden will... I mean, the Democrats are still saying they're going to have another stimulus package of around two and a half billion trillion dollars, two and a half trillion dollars, which is a monstrous amount of money, right? On top of everything else they're doing. And America can keep doing this because it prints money and the rest of the world keeps buying its money. So, you know, because the US dollar is a reserve currency, people keep lending to the US government because they've got to hold US treasuries. And the challenge is that there's no inflation. So there's no economic handbrake on governments continuing to spend a lot of money. So Biden has said he's going to spend, you know, an additional $2 trillion on building a new America. That's great. And Trump, the, one of the only areas Trump failed was infrastructure. He, he, he did nothing on infrastructure. 
whereas Biden has a plan on infrastructure focusing on renewable energy. So that's quite an upheaval because America is the biggest producer of energy in the world and is self-sufficient, uh, you know, in oil, you know, which is quite remarkable. So there's a chance that, that Joe Biden might reverse that. But I think also, you know, he will pump money into the states, whereas the Republicans won't. And in America, all states have a requirement, almost all states have a requirement that they can only spend what they collect in revenue. Right. So they can't have a deficit budget. So if they lose money as they have because of the coronavirus, then unless they get money from Washington, they have to start cutting back on services. And then it becomes a bit of a death spiral in places. I mean, as you know, Illinois and Chicago, I mean, Chicago's broke. Illinois state, I mean, some of these states have the worst financial positions. I mean, the junk bond status. And that's a big risk to America's prosperity into the future. So what do you think, let's say we're an Australian business, um, one, the, you know, we see America as a great export pool because, you know, 350, 60 million people, there's a great place everybody, and everybody wants to sell into America because we don't have a big yeah. market here. If you're an Australian and you're doing a, a macro positioning of where you should take your product in the future and you think Biden's, you know, if you see Biden as a, if they're listening to you and they see Joe Hockey says Biden's a, a likely winner of all this, and uh, the economic outcome could be that um, Americans could end up having less money in their pocket, do you think? Or do you think he's going to put Americans into a better position? In other words, tax the rich and sort of you know, Robin Hood style, pay back to the poor or pay back to the middle class? Is he a middle class type of guy? Yeah, he is a middle class type of guy, you know, and, and I think it, it, so much will depend on who he appoints to key position. But yes, he is a middle class, very much middle class type of guy and middle class values. And um, a very decent human being, by the way. I mean, really decent. And Americans know that as well. I think they've picked that. You know, if, you, if you're coming into the United States, you've got to pick your market where you want to go, and that depends on the product or service you have. There are some Aussie businesses that have gone into Denver, Colorado, doing, you know, a great job, uh, depending on, you know, and that's, that's, you know, low tax environment, great quality of life, uh, pretty vibrant city, bit of a bit of an aviation hub. San Francisco is a really expensive place to enter into America. LA is, is you know, a very difficult town to get your head around, but a great place for certain things. And, and the list goes on. So you've really got to work out, you know, it depends on your product and your service and how you're going to do it. Look, yeah, America survives because it's the most innovative nation on earth by far. I mean, every little town in America seems to have some company that, is headquartered there that has been a world hit world business, a worldwide business. I mean, you know, and, and that's little town America is in fact, you know, big town world. It's, it's crazy. You know, you can go to screw knuckle Creek, Idaho, and there could be two companies there that are the biggest in the world of what they do. And that's, that's, that's America. And why is it so decentralized? Because it has this unbelievable river system that, takes water at all corners of the, 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 the country. And therefore, you know, you can have a great quality of life and fertile land and in all parts of, almost all parts of America. It hasn't got this great big desert in the middle like Australia or, 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 or Africa. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's, it's got great access to ports. It's, uh, and, and it's got a massive consumer class. So it's, it's, it's a phenomenal, the amount of money here, Mark, I just, I, like I just every day I just am stunned how much available capital there is for investment or procurement. It's just mind blowing. Yeah, that, that's something I want to talk about because like a lot of people come to me and they sort of say, "Look, I've got this business. It's a really good business, and it was perhaps it's a global exporting business for product or services, or it's a or it's a great tech idea." And they say, "I really like to go to the valley and raise some money and." Most people haven't had any experience of, of um, what, go, what goes on in the United States in terms of the West Coast of, of the US in terms of raising money. You, you're mentioning some of the states where the money's, the money's available, like you know, pro, where the professional investors are. Can you give, uh, give us a bit of a sense in terms of your experience, particularly what you know, Bondo Partners does now, you know, how you get to meet these organisations who have got money to invest? Well, you know, the starting point is to use the Australian network. 
because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So the American Australian Association, the AAA, which is expanding in the US, the Chamber of Commerce, Australian Chamber of Commerce, and, and you know, I spoke to in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, or uh, in um, Austin, Texas, uh, using your Austrade people. Uh, we've got Austrade offices in uh, Houston, and San Francisco and LA and Chicago and New York, just using that network and importantly, just having some sounding boards, you know, some mentors, some sounding boards. I know you've done a lot of mentoring over the years. I think that's as important here in the United States or anywhere as, as it is in Australia. I mean, you've got to have business mentors and that's what we try and do. We try and hook up people that might be able to help in various places. Uh, but we do it, you know, we do it for a fee. I mean, we charge big retainers because, you know, you get what you pay for. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's no free service in America. Nothing's free in America. Well, totally, nor should it be. Um, but if, if, if like, let's say someone's, I mean, like, I don't know, but the money, the mo there's, there's very little capital or, or uh, liquidity here in Australia. I mean, there's a couple of, you know, bigger organisations like, you know, Daniel Petrie's Airtree Ventures and a, there's Blackbird. Yeah. There's a few of them around who are, yeah, typical um, early stage investors, um, but America's like like the stacks of them. Is is our Americans, well, in, in the on the west coast of America, are they do they like to invest in Australian businesses? I mean, do you just is it just a matter of talking to Bono Partners and Bono Partners hooks you up with Austrade or they hook you up with uh, the 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 AAA Australian American or American Australian uh, Association yeah. whatever it is a Chamber of Commerce yeah. over there is that just yeah. what it, I mean or is that all it is or 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 do you sort of say listen I know five investors and uh, they'd like you know I, I, you your organisation will will represent you we'll go and see these organisations with your proposal uh, well no I mean we do it on a much larger scale so you know we're we're doing it with bigger companies, yep. you know, you've just got to do a lot of research before you go into any new market. You've got to work out who's your competition, where they're located, what what is what is going to be the, the product or service you have that differentiates you from all the competition. And, of course, in a market of 340 million people, there is competition. There's a lot more than there is in Australia. Totally. Uh, because someone else may well have come up not only with the idea for your widget, but one that works and is fully compatible with the American ecosystem. You've got to do your research. You've got to spend time over here. You've got to, uh, you know, just build your presence and uh, treat America as a new market. That's really important. It's not as easy as just ring up, you know, Joe Hockey and saying, can you raise me $50 million? So it's, it doesn't work like that. But there, there are 17,000 private equity funds in America something like that, that will invest in the right sort of things. A, you know, a number of them will invest only in the stock market. Others will invest in real estate. It just, it just depends. But you're more likely to find that one key investor and the one key client in the United States than you are anywhere else in the world. It's just you've got to work hard to find. You, you, I don't know if you remember, but you may you probably remember the AVCAL, the Australian Venture Capitalist, uh, whatever it calls, uh, AV, yeah. AVCAL. And they, yeah. they hold events and it's sort of like a, it's a bit like a speed dating environment. You walk in there and there's a whole lot of investors yeah. and you can put up your idea. Does does the US have that sort of same concept? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to a couple in San Francisco and universities put some of them on. Chambers of Commerce put some of them on. There, there are a range of different places that you know they, they do have that sort of presentation and also i mean america you know until now has been until the coronavirus actually really good at having um sort of hubs technology hubs and you know i went to one in um uh, birmingham alabama which was the size of a football field and they would basically nurture a business from a one-person business right up to 100 employees and then shift them next door and the best place to do that is with university campuses. Now, if the universities in Australia would sort of expand their horizons a bit more and start looking at how they can have innovation hubs commercialising on their premises, right next door on their, or on their premises, I, you know, they'd take a leaf out of the book of some of these big universities here 
then I think you'll see more innovation out of Australia. One of the things I've noticed in the, during the COVID period is that a lot of people have, are working from home and as a result of that, they're not traveling, they get two hours of spare a day. And we have seen a massive surge in, let's call it the side hustle, uh, new business ideas and people starting to build up new concepts. But the big issue for Australians, that, that, which I'm observing, and we're talking about small business ideas, but they're great. some of them are great ideas. And some of these things are actually advanced beyond ideas. But the big issue for Australians is there's nowhere to get capital. There's no liquidity. I mean, the United States is full liquidity and there's always, as you say, there's always an investor for something or for your, yeah. your idea, assuming it passes muster. The big issue here in Australia is that we just don't have the capital. There's nobody out there um, trying to promote these. Well, we do. We do have it. The problem is that there's a monstrous incentive to put it into the stock market and get yeah. zero tax dividends yeah. than to put it into a startup small business where there's you know a huge amount of risk and you won't see a dividend for years. That's the flip. What would you say though? If you're if you're talking to Josh, our our um, you know our treasurer, what would you say to Josh Frydenberg right now? Like because you know these businesses, if they get the capital, it might, it might only be talking about a million dollars or two million dollars, can kick off. They will employ somebody. You know, and the, that story that Australia is going to recover off the back of the uh, small to medium enterprises in this country, you know, they do employ set, nearly 70% of all our workers. If we want more employment or we want to reduce that unemployment yeah. number, we've got to get money into yeah. these businesses. What would you say to Josh? I'm, I'm, it's not for me to give Josh public advice. Totally. I'm, I'm curious, but, but, you know, one of the things I am mindful of is... The returns you get out of a lot of different funds or money in the bank are so low. In fact, gosh, someone told me that in one of the banks, they said they have a deposit for $90 million in cash and they're paying less than 1% interest. Yeah. $90 million. I mean, come on, really? So why wouldn't you start looking to invest in small businesses and startup businesses? I think there is a window of opportunity. I'd... Not only, you know, I not only have the capital gains tax discount, I'd halve it again. On these type of investments? It's on investments. Yeah, I'd say, look, you want to put money into a startup business, you can have, uh, you know, 10% capital gains tax. So, so you, I mean, you, 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 were the runner of, you were the runner of fiscal policy in this country. I mean, and, and you know how, yeah. because monetary policy hasn't got much. Correct. There's nothing left. So the, the, the beauty of that is, you, you, you know, capital gains tax in this environment, in a depressed economic environment, is going to be down at any rate. So, you know, if it's going to be down at any rate, you might as well cut the tax and incentivise people to have a go. And you're, Why not? Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I, I mean, I, I, and I, I, I guess you saw our budget that came out, or the budget that came out more recently. And, uh, and of course, um, you know, the... As usual, you know, the mainstream television, they just ripped the hell out of him and, you know, and uh, the, the opposition got up there and he, they had a crack. And right, if you can't be popular when you have the biggest spending budget in the history of the country, when are you ever going to be popular delivering a budget? I mean, I, you had to mention the B word, but um, the budget word. But, you know, I, I was reading, uh, like, you know, people like Phil Curry and a few others and they're, oh, that 2014 budget was terrible. Actually... According to the benchmarks these days, no budget is good. Yeah. But if you're going to have a big spending budget, then and the, the benchmark is a big spending budget is a great budget, then, of course, one day you have to have a budget that saves money. Yeah. And therefore that will be unpopular. And budgets have gone somehow into this popularity contest instead of actually doing what's right. And even when you're doing the family budget, sitting around the table, <clears throat> it's not popular. You don't feel good about it. You say, look, you know, how much are we going to spend on, you know, the car and insurance and, you know, I mean, it's a torturous process. No one enjoys doing that, really. Totally. I mean, you just want to have enough money to be able to do what you want to do, right? But that, that joy is, is rare. And I think, you know, when it comes to budgets, the government's recent budget, was right for the times. I mean, it was it was the right budget structured in the right way. It's never going to be perfect, but you don't know what perfect is until two years after you've delivered it, right? And what the world looks like. But it was the right budget for the times, as has been every budget for the last 
10 to 15 years, right? Or 20 years. I mean, almost, you know, the budgets were right. There was a period there where there was just too much built in generous welfare provided, which made too many people in Australia reliant on, on government payments. And I think that was a disservice to the country when we should have spent more on, you know, upgrading, for example, infrastructure or hospitals or, or whatever the case might be, schools. But in the end, the states came along and did that at any rate. And, you know, the infrastructure is being upgraded, but, you, you know, you've got to save your pennies when you can because these days do come along. Well, it's funny, and I described the budget the other day as the stop calling it a budget, stop looking at it as a budget. You know, we passed the budget period. This is an incredibly unusual year. This is really just a stimulus package. And by the way, if, if the government hasn't covered off every aspect, but they find out in three months or six months or 12, that they need to do something else, they can always make changes. Of course they can. Course they can. Absolutely. It's not the only thing we're ever going to see. A bit like a business. I can do a budget and then I do forecast. And every month I re-forecast based on what, what, what's happening. And, uh, and, and the problem is right. the media pick you apart on based on what you said today, they give you no uh, no latitude in terms of making changes down the track, which by the way, already this year, we've had a number of um, initiatives by the government, like a whole heap of them, and I don't see any reason why they're gonna stop. Correct, you're right. A budget, yeah, that's right. The budget is the best estimate at a certain point in time. Correct, and you can make changes down the track, and, and it's, well, but it's not about yeah. popularity. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but, but look, Australia is blessed with overall, good government, you know, truly. I mean, we are, we are really blessed. And, uh, uh, you know, you can have your differences and so on, but I tell you what, it's, it's, you know, it's more bipartisan in Australia than almost any other country in the world, even though at times it doesn't feel like it. You're obviously like a, an average observer of what happens here in Australia in the political scene. I've seen a rise, or most Australians have now witnessed a rise of something that we never really considered before, and that is a rise of premiers. A bit like what's happening in America, there's been a rise of governors at a state level. And to some extent, the, the, that whole, the whole constitutional issue about like who can sort of influence what, whether the federal government can influence this or they've got no influence over certain things other than using parts of the constitution where there's a conflict. But generally speaking, we've all become now really aware that, of the fact that the federal government doesn't have a lot of control over regulations within a state. And we've seen the rise of state premiers mm -hmm. and the polit and then the political nature of those particular state premiers, if they're, if they're not the same flavour as the federal government, they are pretty much thumbing their nose at the federal government. And, you know, we've seen in Queensland, I mean, for me, I've seen the, the Queensland, members of the Queensland, ministers in the Queensland government actually having a crack at, in a, to me, what, a, what I consider to be a disrespectful way of our prime minister. What are you feeling about this? This is something would never happened in your era, in the John Howard era, et cetera, and, you know, and the Costello sure. era and the Hawker era. would never actually have ever happened. No one would even contemplate doing it. We have seen a, 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 greater, a, a stronger relationship between responsibility, accountability and power. So, you know, the great example is, is, is Governor Cuomo in New York. So he's dealing with this coronavirus crisis. Healthcare, even though it's funded federally in America and funded federally in Australia, it's delivered by the states, right? So the person or the, the, the government that is responsible for delivery is now responsible for policy. That's what matters. When money doesn't matter, you, you, you're going to the person responsible who has to deliver. Cuomo's problem was, for example, he had to deal with the coronavirus crisis. He had this huge hospital system in New York State, but he didn't control hospitals because the private sector here is, you know, is private. I mean, they don't have any relationship with the public sector at all. And the health insurance companies have relationships with individual hospitals. So if I, Joe Hockey, as I was, uh, were paying... $45,000 a year for health care for my wife and children, US, to have the same level of health care we have in Australia for a private insured, privately insured person. Right? So we we're paying over 4000 a month, you know, more than just around 4000 a month. 
out of our pocket, the US. And I want, for that amount of money, if one of, one of us gets coronavirus, damn right I want to be able to get in the hospital. And I'm not paying all that money every year to get behind other people that don't pay any money. That sounds terrible, but it's the reality, right? Otherwise, why am I paying $45,000 a year? And so what happens, those hospitals held on to all the gowns and all the, the, the PPE, you know, the, the protective equipment and made sure they had the best, you know, um, machines that would help people survive. Cuomo's trying to move the supply to where the battle is in New York City, but none of the hospitals will tell him what they have. In New South Wales, when I spoke to Gladys Berejiklian about this, she said, well, it took us about two weeks to find all the PPE in the state. So, of course, you know, even though Mudgy is really important and Orange is really important, getting the PPE to where the breakouts are, the nursing homes or the hospitals, is what really matters. And because we are involved in the whole health system, we can do that. To try and do that out of Canberra or Washington is impossible, really because they're too far away from the actual delivery. And, you know, Mark, it's really interesting about the US election. They have 10,000 different ways to vote in America. Wow. So every county has its own rules about how you can vote for the president of the United States. So even though it's a federal election for president of the United States, individual counties set the, the voting rules. Some counties say you can only vote uh, on the day. Other counties say you can vote anytime. Some counties or states will just send ballot papers to every household. They just put them in the letterbox, right? And, you know, the fraud is huge, right? That's because the, the, the actual election responsibility is not in the hands of the federal administration. It's in the hands of the locals. But in Australia, we have the Australian Electoral Commission that governs Australian elections. We have a state electoral commission that covers state elections. So there is a direct alignment between responsibility, accountability, and implementation. And the, and the more you can align them, the better the outcomes for people. So, you know, it, it, if you've got a hospital system, the best people to deliver the best hospital system are the states, individual states, and maybe individual cities or individual area health boards, whatever they are, in individual states. But that's where the coalface is and they're the most responsive. In, in a relative sense, what, I think what you're saying to us is that Australia's in really good shape. Australia, man, Australia's the greatest, greatest country on earth. We are so blessed to be Australian. And uh, it's just, uh, and, and we, are, we, are, we are blessed with a, with a great, you know, I mean, a history that is not perfect, but geez, you know, it's, it's made, us, made us the nation we are today. And it's, it's, you know, I miss it. The envy of yeah. the whole world. I really believe that. And, and Joe, when are we expect to see? When, when are we going to see you back here in Sydney? Well, I'm I'm coming to visit November and after the election, and then uh, I can't miss miss summer in Sydney, but uh, or in Australia, but uh, but I'm coming back here in January. I mean, I'm building the business across two continents, and uh, and it's you know it's going really well. And the reason why it's going well is because you can't cold call in a COVID yeah. world. There's, you know, everyone can be a stranger in a COVID world. So people will say, oh, yeah, I know Joe Hockey. Why don't we speak to Joe and he might know someone that can help us. And the same going the other way. Trusted relationships are going to be the most valuable commodity of the 21st century. And, uh, and you know, existing relationships, you've just got to try and build them rather than spending a lot of time and effort trying to build new relationships with people that you can't meet. Well, trusted relationships and with uh, people with integrity mm -hmm. and the ability to execute. I mean, in other words, skill. I mean, and I, I don't mind saying this, but I was always a Joe Hockey fan when he was a treasurer. And, you know, Joe Hockey, by the way, was tutored by one of the great treasurers as well, Peter Costello. A lot of people don't know this. I mean, they haven't been around long enough, but I remember those periods very, very well, vividly. Um, they were my <laughs> wizard days. And, uh, and I, I know him to be a fair and upfront bloke. So, mate, I can't wait for you to get back. Me and Fordo are going to take your lunch. Ah, good. If I can get money out of Fordo, mate, I'm there. there. I didn't say he's going to pay. Either I'll pay or you'll pay. But oh, don't good. Worry. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah same, same pot. Same pot, yeah. Great to, great to be with you, mate.
Exactly. Thanks, Joe. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, mate.